everyone. Welcome to the board regular session of March 12, 2019. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all for coming out tonight for what is the spring version of Indian summer in Michigan, so we have a few days of nice weather and then we're going to get hit with cold weather again. Um, trustee Eastep is in California on a business trip. Student Representative Samantha is in Puerto Rico doing some service work. Jim, is he on a mic? We can't hear you I was just commenting that Trustee okay. Eastep is in California on a business okay. trip and Student Representative Samantha is in Puerto Rico doing um, service work. So they are missing this week. So let's get uh, started with the student showcase tonight and we have poetry out loud. Um, no, we don't. Oh, you get the old one. Oh, sorry, you got the old one. I have the new one here. Uh, so we're doing SHS clubs with Mr. Rath. Thank you. Poetry will be later. Later. <laughs> and so, um, and this person on. One of the things I, I just realized my first couple of years at the middle at the high school was how many organizations and clubs that we actually offer for our students. And I think it's exciting that we have as many opportunities for our students. One, um, it gives students pretty much an opportunity to, to choose and pick something that they're interested in. And so when we talk about clubs and organizations, we talk about 79 of them at Slane High School. Uh, and they, they're a variety of uh, clubs and organizations. Um, I'm going to introduce to you uh, Anna Brittnell, who is uh, working. She works in community education. However, she also spends quite a bit of time at Slane High School because she oversees our clubs and organizations. It's something that we needed to kind of pigeonhole because we had so many people going so many different directions. It was kind of hard to kind of understand what we had going because there is, like I said, every day and every night and before school and after school and on the weekends, we have our groups of students working within our schools. Um, and if you would ever want to stop by on a Friday night. From three to five, you'll see some real excitement going on in the media center, uh, which they'll share in a little bit. Um, so, one of the things we do is like when you want to start a club, we do, we do not turn students away if they're interested in starting a club. One of the things we do is we we do want to have um, them to share a purpose of what they're interested in doing. Um, we try not to have any similar clubs. That's one of the questions we talk through because there are some clubs that actually sometimes come in looking very similar to other clubs. Uh, so uh, it's kind of to the student and the advisor to kind of work with that and kind of explain why they're not similar in, in nature. Um, we try to relate it to our curriculum in some way, um, if there is that interest there. Uh, it doesn't always have to be into a curriculum, but like I said, there's value in all the clubs and organizations that we have. The first part of it is they enter a trial year. So when they say they have a club, they have they found an advisor, which we'd like it to be on a staff member at Slane Area Schools or s somewhere, um, and they um, talk about a meeting schedule, they, they come up with a constitution which needs to be done by March, uh, and then they get that first year to kind of see how lo longevity it is. Not all of our clubs and organizations come with a stipend, um, but uh, they definitely don't come the first year. But as, as the time goes on, depending on the, on the longevity of it and, and how many students are involved, uh, then we take a look at that, and that's that's more of a negotiated item as well. So I'm going to turn it over to Anna right now. Um, just really quick, I appreciate Mr. Raff allowing me to come over. Uh, and Brian Puffer, my main boss, is, is out in the audience. He just uh, being flexible with me and allowing me to kind of get into high school and see kids, which was a huge transition point for me. So I appreciate both of you for that. Um, we currently have 79 clubs categorized. Uh, we recategorized them kind of. This process started in January, and I think one of the first goals was to try to come up with some type of clarity with, with how we organize them. So we, we did that first. Um, now we're kind of in the process of making sure all 79 of those clubs are active. Um, and then as we move through the spring, just kind of reviewing what we're doing and uh, potentially coming up with a new system for next fall. I'm going to pass out to you the, how they're categorized. And again, this is something that's put together this year by Anna, which is a very helpful. <clears throat> So we're fortunate we brought uh, five of those clubs here tonight out of the 79. You will hear from, um, we'll kind of call it their student leader. Some of them brought a group with them. And we'll start with the ever famous Smash Bros. Brock, you and your friends can stand up. And we narrowed it down. We just randomly selected some. They each got 10 minutes to speak. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so Brock, yeah, introduce your people you brought with you. Yeah. 
Yes. Hi, I'm Brock Mayfield. Um, I'm here representing Smash Club, uh, Celine Super Smash Club. I'm here with uh, three of my other leaders here that help me form the club. Um, you guys want to introduce yourselves? Yeah, I'm Zach. I'm a senior. Um, in terms of Smash Club, I run a lot of the technological side of things. Um, I run our website that we have as well as create um, our brackets and sort of stuff like that for our tournaments that we run. Um, all the brackets are hosted online and completely digital and everybody can access them through our website as well as, uh, as, well as other resources that we have. Um, I'm Aaron Brenner. I'm more of a community leader in the club. I try to make sure everything runs smoothly during the meetings and the tournaments to make sure everyone's having a good time and there's no problems. Um, I'm Eddie Ozer. I'm the social media manager of the club. So I run the Instagram, make sure everyone keeps updated for what happens to people. Yes, and I am more the communication side. I talk to advisors, I talk to higher ups like Mr. Raft and stuff like that to make sure the club is running well and seeing about um, new things we can do and whatnot. So, yeah. Should I start? Okay. Yes. So, uh, Super Smash Bros., in case you aren't familiar, it's a fighting game that's made by Nintendo. It's been pretty popular for, throughout the years. Um, the statistic is that in the tournaments that have ran throughout um, since the game's inception, there's been almost $10 million in prize money for us individuals. Um, so we're kind of the combination of both the casual and competitive side of the game. Uh, we encourage people from all different uh, variety of backgrounds to come. Um, we've been operational for about three months now. And we have uh, 60, we're, we're coming in on 70 members, active members that are showing up each week uh, to play. And um, you know, starting the club was quite easy, actually. So we had this idea, it's a very odd idea, not really a typical club for the school. Uh, you know, Barack and all of us were like, is this even gonna be possible? You know, is it gonna work? Um, like, logistically, we have to bring in all these, like, consoles and systems. Um, but, you know, we talked to Ms. Steger and then Ms. Burdell, who really helped us kind of figure out how we can run this and the operations of it. And we were able to actually, you know, get our first, uh, like, informational meeting out uh, in only a couple weeks from the idea, so. Right. Eddie, would you like to talk? Oh yeah, so I want to, one of the best things about this club definitely has to be the inclusivity. Uh, you know, there's so many clubs I think where you really have to fit in a sort of type of category, and you really have to just fit a certain mold to be part of that. And this club doesn't have that. You know, you can literally not. You don't even have to be good at the game to even still come. You know, this, you, this everyone from all likes to walk in this club. That's you know, draws people in, and I think that's one of the most prominent aspects. It. Definitely. Um, I think that's one of our main um, attributes of our club. Um, it is very collaborative. It helps like bring people together. Everyone is there together trying to have fun playing this game. People who don't know each other are playing with each other. In tournaments, you play people that you don't know. You're there with other people trying to have fun. So it's all everyone coming together, having fun playing this game. And the reason that I knew that this would work in my mind is that I know people love this game and I just wanted to give them a place to play it. And um, furthering off of what Brock said, you know, as leaders we've really learned a lot more on how, you know, club works and we've really had to deal with a lot of like, you know, collaboration aspects of it. Um, you know, we have a sort of system where we have about five leaders, one couldn't make it today. Um, but, you know, in opposed to a sort of hierarchical system where we have like a, a president and a vice president, we've really been allowed to you know, explore a much more wide variety of topics and opinions on certain ideas and how the club should be ran. And I think our sort of system of just leaders and not having a certain, like, you know, role that you have to fit has been really nice in kind of uh, getting the club to where it is now. Um, yeah. And then yeah. Finally, you know, communication. So uh, a lot of these uh, members aren't really, you know, uh, not a lot, but some are not uh, as involved in athletics and they don't really get to learn as much of like the value of sportsmanship and some of those virtues that um, you know, are found a lot in sports specifically. So I think uh, Smash Club gives a lot of people uh, the opportunity to learn more about sportsmanship, and as well as communicating positively with other members. Um, we try to uh, avoid as much as like negative conflict, because you know, obviously emotions can you know, get riled up when you're playing and you know, something bad happens. So we try to you know, enforce like, positive communication between members as much as possible. Um, and I think that the most important part of the club, and my favorite part of the club, is the community that we've built, and that's a community we're always trying to grow, trying to get more people into the club. Um, because without that community, the club just wouldn't be the same as it is now. Uh, we'd like to thank the board for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One of the things I didn't really touch on is, but it's really, it's evident with the students, is that it's all student-led. 
We have advisors. They're not doing as much as the students are. The students are leading it. They're, they're char they're, you saw right there, they, took ch they take charge of the meetings. They take charge of what's happening. And they take charge and be, they're responsible for what they're trying to represent. The next one is one of our oldest organizations, probably, that does a lot for our student voice. We're going to introduce to you our SHS Student Council. And it's freshman president Emma Driscoll. Does that mic work? Yeah, but she could turn on it. for giving me this opportunity and I am in ninth grade and I'm a freshman class president which is my role in the club of student council and student council as you might know is an active leadership club where some of the most passionate leaders of Saline High School collaborate to effectively plan and organize events to supplement learning as well as the social aspect of life for our students and I'm really here today to talk to you about how student council relates to our conference and so I'm going to focus on two of the aspects of our compass, which would be creativity. And to get further into that, our club spends countless amount of hours planning events using everyone's creative minds. And everyone has their different creativity levels. And another part of that would be collaboration, of course. And using our creativ creativity to collaborate and create all these events it's a big thing that we have found to be successful and we spend a lot of time doing that and with the ability to collaborate with each other so often in such positive space like the high school we are able to get our creativity flowing and in return we have exciting events to host and are making positive changes all the time in the high school and then to add on for critical thinking this could be a challenging one because we have so many ideas that are always flowing through our brains to make our high school a better place. But the critical thinking aspect is our skill that makes things realistic and our mindful builder so that we can see what's really going to be able to happen in a certain period of time. All in all, student council has been a phenomenal way for me to start my high school career with the opportunity of giving back and expressing my care for my peers. And finally, to conclude, this club is a clear representation of our seminary school's compass and how the high school individually falls into our pursuit of excellence here in seminary schools. So thank you. Thank you. How many? Students are represented from each class, so it's like a large in, 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 uh, student ten. council. Yeah, twenty from each class. Thank you. I don't even know. <laughs> I asked the students. There you go. Um, next, to near and dear to the Celine Heart FFA, is Luke Gerlinger. deals with the compass. Uh, communication is a huge thing with our FFA. We helped park cars for a craft show. We did chicken contests. We grew chickens in our back lab and took them up to uh, a butcher, I forget the name of it right now, and we went through the whole process and they talked to us and we talked to them and we had judges we'd interact with and see you know, who had the best chickens different um, off of your weight, your, the way you grew them and everything. Um, I just got back from st uh, state convention up in East Lansing uh, Science Fair. Like I said, I mean, we deal with a whole bunch of judging, a lot of communication, different schools. I mean, there was one point during the meeting they mentioned there was two over two thousand people there that you just interact with. Multiple schools, different schools. Um, there's 64 people in the same area at that day. We've been around for 83 years. Um, Another thing that we talk, uh, really look at on campus is creativity. How we can help the community in different ways. We do craft show, we're doing community service. We're uh, just seeing what we can do to make Selena a better place. We're, we're selling flowers week before Mother's Day to everyone in the city of Selena. 
Interesting enough, the FFA does also have a dunk tank that they, they raise money and they, they would love to have board members be part of that in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next one is uh, Brianna Camaro Sulak and Sabrina Stock uh, with Uproar. Hi, uh, my name is Brianna Camaro Sulak. I use she her pronouns, and this is my fourth year in the club. Hi, hi, I'm Sabrina Stock. I'm also a senior leader. This is my fourth year in the club as well, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. So we are up for the Social Justice and Diversity Council at Celine, and our goal basically is to raise awareness, educate, and advocate for certain and basically all social identities and topics. And we hope to do this so we can make our community, our state, and our school safer and more equitable for everybody in it. And some of the uh, amazing things that we have done are uh, teach professional development, which includes uh, admin and teachers, and we have uh, implemented with under our leading open houses uh, every month. So we uh, after school one day we invite everyone who wants to come, and we talk about allyship and sexual assault at those. And we are always requested for a couple of years in a row now to teach a P psych lesson on gender identity and gender expression, and in sports sociology class about privilege. And we even held the I Am Jazz event here a couple months ago in December, where over 100 people in the community gathered, where we read the book I Am Jazz. And uh, we, most recently, on this past Friday, we went to the statewide Gender and Sexuality Alliances Summit at Grand Valley State University, where over 400 people from across the state gathered to learn and present about uh, different aspects of identities. And we, with Abby Berwick, uh, had the privilege of having our proposal accepted. So we presented in front of over 50 people about allyship, and it was so amazing. Um, and we even rode in the Hornet Mobile there, uh, and the uh, uh, carpool jams were A plus. <laughs> So basically, kind of like adding on to what Brianna said, the impact that we've seen has just been extraordinary. And I, I can speak for the both of both of us that we are so honored to have been in and like leading this club. I know that not only for our community, but also for our state and our peers, teachers, uh, community members, we've had the honor of seeing people change and be more aware about these topics than they were before. Uh, even in our own group we've seen such amazing impact on the students. I know, especially in our group, we have a lot of shy kids I know, that don't know how to share their passion, but they have so much of it. And from the beginning of this year to the end of it, uh, I've seen them grow so much, and they've been able to stand up in front of our community and share their thoughts and speak more proudly. And it, it's really, I'm very proud, not only of our community, but also of the people in our group for being so brave and sharing their thoughts. Uh, so basically, just to summarize that, our group worked so hard to work in line with the SHS Compass and SAS Compass, and all of those ideals like collaboration, uh, creativity, critical thinking, communication, we all work so hard to go with in line with those. So with collaboration and communication, like we've been working with people across the state, hundreds of people in different diversity groups, uh, groups and clubs to improve theirs, and they can improve ours. We've decided to maybe host events with them. We work so hard to create that connection with people that aren't even in our community so we can improve each other's. Uh, even in our group with creativity and critical thinking, we work uh, with a lot of events. So it takes so much time to plan them out and figure out who they have to do what and how can we best discuss these social topics in a way that people will be interested and learn from them. Uh, so we work so hard to keep that SA, uh, SAS compass in mind when we do our work and we're so glad that we've been able to follow it because the results and impact we've seen has just been extraordinary and we are so happy that we've been able to see that impact. And it's very important to remember that social justice and social change doesn't just happen. You have to work for it, believe in your cause, and be ready to defend it. And that is what we do in Upward. And on behalf of Upper, Mr. Hamilton and Mrs. Trezor, we want to always thank uh, the SHS admin and the Board of Education for their endless support of us and our passion for equality. Okay. So 
with the exception of Emma, you've heard mostly from seniors, and we were going to roll with the four groups that we had today until I had a last minute meeting last Friday with a group of five freshmen who were had such a great blueprint for what they want to do that I had to bring them in. Um, Grace Munch can come on up. They're actually in the process of having a club start in the fall of 19, but they have already sent me a calendar, a uh, agenda item list through November, and they are rolling with it. So I wanted you to hear from them and kind of see the early process from a bunch of freshmen. Hello, I'm Grace Munch. I'm in ninth grade in Sorbonne. Um, this is Haley Malinzak and Julie Munch. Hi, so today we're here on behalf of the new High Five Club, and basically our club is represented through your hand. Um, each finger represents a word that symbolizes our club. So we have assistance, community, caring, compassion, and service. So the main purpose of our club is to bring care and attention to those in our community that don't receive a lot of it. And one of the main groups that we want to focus on are those that are in assisted living homes. And this is mainly because many of those people don't have family that live close by or even any family at all to come visit them while they're in there. And we wanted to show that there are people in our community that do care and we wanted to bring that attention to them. By the end of the school year, we hope to be in contact with Linden Square, Brecken Village, and the Ethan Job Homes. And we also have already started an Instagram account. We have about 87 people that are interested in at least thinking about joining our club. So thank you so much thank for you. having us. Well, you can actually see why it's easy to go to work every day because this is what we're dealing with uh, on a daily basis. And it starts from kindergarten all the way through their senior year and, and, and beyond. So at this time, um, although we didn't hit every club, would have been here a long time if we did. Uh, but at this point, any questions for us or the clubs in general? I have a follow-up question for Smash Bros. So to, to Eddie's point, I would say that it, it is a true true extended uh, via Anna, extended an invitation, uh, and my family got to go and play Smash Bros. And uh, little Ryan is right back there, so he might he might challenge you to a rematch. But um, it was it was great energy. I mean, like Friday night, this is what the kids are doing. They're meeting in the media center. They had pizza. They offered us food. I mean, very very great. And um, I had a follow up question because Brock asked me about grants and funding, yeah. and a few people you should talk to about that are in the back of the room right now. But um, I just wondered what you and Anna were going to do in follow up with uh, funding for the club and what you wanted to spend that money on if you went for, forward with a grant proposal. Yes, so um, you want me to stand up? Sure, and then everybody can hear you. Yeah. Um, so we had uh, ideas about what to do with the money. Um, we talked to Mr. Raft about expanding the club. Um, we were thinking about um, making it more inclusive to not just our. Um, Community, like it be more local. Mm -hmm. um, it could be you're thinking possibly like Saturdays. We could have longer tournaments and such and whatnot. Right. So Across the be, different schools, like you were talking definitely, about. Definitely, yeah. yeah. So we we have been all like talking about this, wanting to get this like going, and um, like donations and grants for that could really help us out. Um, like getting the message out and like finding out how to um, set up these huge uh, tournaments and whatnot. I think a, you know Smash Bros uh, is a great club because otherwise you have people who typically will be at home playing by themselves, Definitely. right? And so just drawing people out and bringing them out and, and participating together is a great thing. Yeah, I see. Personally, like I met a lot of like underclassmen that I would really not like interact mm -hmm. with previously. Um, you know, like taking a bunch of senior classes, you don't really get the opportunity to really connect with underclassmen. Um, and I think I met a lot of like really, really cool people through Smash Club that otherwise just would have never, never met my time through high school. Right. And that goes for all your clubs. You're, you're drawing people in and getting them out to do things that they otherwise wouldn't. That should really be the focus. Yeah. One of the things I'd like all of you clubs to consider is taking it one step further and doing things together as a club. You have yeah. to, you know, across clubs, too often now, you know, we're all in our little silos and doing things as, as adults, and we don't really talk to one another. So yeah, I would encourage these clubs to try to do things together. We're also going to try to teach, especially a lot of these senior heavy groups, about just the concept of turnover and what's going to happen in the next three months. So as I start visiting, we're going to, we're going to talk a lot about that, what that looks like for them. 
Well, thank you. Oh, thank, thank you guys for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Presentation is heritage. Good evening. I'm Laura Washington. I'm the very proud principal of Heritage School. And I have some friends with me who will be presenting about Heritage Book a Day and Classroom Book a Day. So there is a quiz at the end. So you, we're going to add, hopefully, you're going to have the answer of, to these three questions. Number one, what is Classroom Book a Day in Her or Heritage Book a Day or and or? What is the general impact of picture books? And what has the impact been on staff and students at Heritage? All right, I'm gonna just start. My name is Kristen Hohen. I am a fifth grade teacher at Heritage. And uh, we really got the idea for Classroom Book a Day and Heritage Book a Day while attending a professional development conference this summer at, it's called Nerd Camp. It's an excellent literacy conference in Michigan, actually in West Michigan, just outside of Kalamazoo. And it's attended by people all over the country and even all over the world. Literally this year, I the, the registration opened at 5.30, and I think it was full by like 7 a.m. 7 a.m. So it's very, um, it's a great literacy conference. And at this conference, there was a, set, there was a session about book a day. And um, they really talked a lot about how nobody is too um, old to read a picture book. And I think that's kind of where it all starts. This graphic here really kind of hits sort of the main points of Book A Day that for kids and adults of all ages, um, books should be all of these things. So they should be mirrors. So every student, no matter their identity, their gender, anything, should be able to see themselves in a picture book. They should be windows to see into worlds that are not their own. And then sliding glass doors, opening themselves up into a new world. There's a whole lot of things that books are. Um, springboards, escape hatches, quiet corners, overcoats, flying carpets. So the idea of Book A Day is that you are sharing something with the kids that is maybe related to the curriculum, maybe not, but um, it opens up a whole world of conversation. So the idea is that you read one picture book every day with the kids. And um, you can see kind of in the displays, this one on top is our classroom. This is um, the Urban and Latona team in fourth grade. And then over here, um, when we were at the conference, Mrs. Washington said, why does it just have to be in classrooms? You know, if your classroom is gonna do it, that's great, but then everybody doesn't get a chance to do it. So she said, what if we as the Heritage Administration made a goal to read a picture book to a classroom every day? So we were in the meeting, she's literally making a list, making a sign of genius to send out to parents to get books because you need 180 books to fund this project. So she's you know, making the sign of genius, we're adding book titles to the list, and we were able to get, I think we have almost all the books we need for the whole year. We're six shorts. Yeah, maybe <laughs> after tonight. Maybe after tonight. Um, the together. Heritage community just kind of came together and sent um, books to Heritage, just through like an Amazon wish list, so it was amazing. And that's been helpful for me. I've been using the public library a lot, going, finding books there. But the idea is that you're reading a book a day to the kids, and what the most important thing is the conversation that comes after the books. And one of my students is going to share kind of the model we use in our classroom for book a day. And having them up is part of the book a day model, just so that the kids can look back, reflect on them, always kind of see the different books that have been windows, mirrors, springboards, all of that stuff for them. So that is Classroom Book a Day and Heritage Book a Day. So what is the impact of picture books? Um, I love so much about this program. But the one thing I love is that there is high impact in a short amount of time. Um, there are so many skills that can be taught. There's a myriad, so much more than what's up here. It also makes a social, emotional connection to the kids. It makes a personal connection wherever you are, whatever age you are, with a picture book. I love that I can extend it, and it can be a two-day lesson, or if I don't have the time, I can do it in 15 minutes. 
I love the repetitiveness of it because it's every day. Those universal things that we talked about can come back around. So if someone's not ready to hear that or to learn it at that time, it comes back and it comes back. It is personal to every person when they are reading this book, when they have this discourse and this exchange with these titles. Um, it is a highlight of our day. And you know, there's themes, there's lessons to be learned, a historical connection, maybe something that you're doing that piggybacks off of science or social studies, and sometimes it's just for fun. You know, we just read some silly stuff that's just for fun. It gives so many opportunities to listen to different readers coming into our classroom, and um, the kids love it. And I have two students here that um, are really passionate about sharing their thoughts and feelings about it. And Mr. Shugo, what's been the impact on the readers? Yeah, multiple impacts on the reader. I mean, for one, uh, as someone talked about, these books being windows and mirrors. So they give us opportunities to talk about kind of different social issues, right? Those issues that really uh, connect strongly to the curriculum, but then also extend beyond it. Um, we have kind of a full set of texts now, right? Um, that we have staff members who can come down and check out from kind of our office space. It gets staff into classrooms, right? So myself. Mrs. Washington, our two school social workers, our school psychologists. So it's great for us to get into the classroom space to make these connections with our students and for them to see us as well. Um, it's been amazing to hear the thinking of our students. Um, we talked about the four C's, lots of critical thinking, really great conversation. And our students are so engaged during these read alouds and conversations as well. It's just been really impressive um, and it's been a joy to be part of. And then finally, we have students here who are going to present about some of the books that they have read. Hi, my name is Hannah Phillips, and one of my favorite book -a days is All I Love. This was our first book -a day, and it was read by Mrs. Washington. The very first day of school, we were lucky enough to have the first, the first heritage book -a day by Mrs. Washington. Um, this really gave this book gave me a motivation to go out of my way and include everyone if they're getting discluded um, and include them. After every book a day, we have our three main questions: What is this book about? What is it really about? And what did this book make you think or feel? What is this book about? Is a short summary to refresh our memory on the book. What is this book really about? Is about the theme or the moral? The moral of the book and what does this book make you think or feel is sharing our thoughts on the book and our feelings on the book. Hello everyone, my name is Jessica Gates. Um, a book a day we read, I remember the first time that I ever read this was in first grade and we read this book pretty much at the beginning of the year. It's called The Invisible Boy and it's about a uh, boy named Brian who is always feeling discluded and nobody really pays attention to him until one day a new student comes in and at lunch some kids make fun of what he eats but Brian puts a note in his copy after school saying that the food he ate looked good to him and later on the new kid came up to him and said thanks and then every time somebody included him he would change a different color like in the beginning of the book, he's all gray until he starts to change color and into like a real person's skin and clothes. And the important life lesson for this is to always include everyone and not make them feel like that. Uh, hi, my name is Anna, and I really love Book a Day because I really like finding out the deeper message in a picture book. And one day, I remembered an old child with a book that I used to read when I was younger. And so I really quickly went to find it. This book was called One Grain of Rice. One Grain of Rice is a math table. I read the book to myself and found a message that the author was trying to convey, other than math. I really wanted to share the book with my other classmates. So the next day, I went to Mrs. Hohen and I asked her if she could read it to the class. She looked at me and then said, would you like to read it instead? I was surprised, but glad that I got this opportunity. I gladly said yes and started practicing. Even though I was nervous, I was excited. Since then, more people have read their books to the class. And that is how Book A Day is individually special for me.
Hi, my name is Ryan, and I really like Heritage Book Day because it gives you like themes and lessons, and some of the books even like teach you about stuff. Because like the Henry Fitzgerald. He read, it was about a sunken boat, and so I, that's why I really like it. Hi, Maria, and I love Heritage of the Day because you get to read so many new books every day, and I feel like this year, I last year we never did that, and I feel like this year I'll be, I like a classroom that's like, I'm going to hold you like very books that you get to read. They're all like, have so such good news to them, and they're all so much better. of the presentation because we did make a presentation video. Chase Stanton was fortunate enough to come to Heritage. We have lots of other students who would like to tell you about Heritage Book Day. The video is 10 minutes long, so you can watch it at your own discretion. So, all right, ready for the quiz? What is Classroom Book a Day or Heritage Book a Day? Every day you read a picture book. Every day you read a picture book. Very good, Ms. Right. What is the general impact of picture books? <laughs> yes. So kids can see themselves, or is it like windows or mirrors? So you can have see the remaining into life and already see yourself in a book? Excellent. Triple bonus points to you. And what has the impact been on staff and students at Heritage? Gideon. <laughs> What's the impact? Yeah. Uh, it's like a social, a social and emotional connection with the kids, uh, the repetitiveness. And triple bonus points to you as well, Mr. Rigone. So thank you very much for letting us present to you. <laughs> Um, we are three months after one of Ms. Lane's biggest boycotts here in Selene. Um, once again, we had an issue where uh, parental rights were being, uh, we, we felt the parental rights were being overstepped, as well as having a class from the sixth graders that were inappropriate. Um, this book dealt with sexual fantasies, references pornography, masturbation, lying to parents, sneaking around on the internet, um, and other unproven myths. Um, and then not to mention some very stereotypical of heterosexual males as insensitive, disrespectful, disrespectful of women's rights, um, and violence. And, and personally, it's not a book I would like to have been read out loud um, for it's not my kid. Um, there were um, some emails sent um, out, and there has been a compromise since then, so that parents have been given an option for another book to be read. And the book is now going to be read silently instead of out loud, so I applaud for the work that has been done. Um, but personally, um, after just nearly two weeks, I was here when Scott Graydon told you that the biggest problem sleep has is that parents do not feel like you are listening to us and changing based on our impact. We have yet another situation where parents are not being listened to. Um, uh, we. Um, 
One of the biggest concerns I have is after the Island Jazz incidents in December, I had some conversations with friends who think differently than I am, and their kids were hurt because parents either brought their kids out of class or had them been sent to school. And they did not understand that most parents objected to either the factual part or our parental rights. And instead, we got called names of you know, uh, homophobe and other attacks. We know it was not the intent of our book. And I feel that this, there's a chance of that happening again with this book. That by the kids are going to look over and see that these other kids have been left another book to read. Um, they're going to be talked about in the hallways, in the lunchrooms. Um, and once again, the book had an issue of social kindness and anti bullying has a chance of being very divisive in our community and again in these sixth graders. Um, I was really hoping with the new diversity committee that we would have a chance for both of these sides to be able to again find common ground. Um, we want a way that we can support all students, that the transgender kids can feel accepted, that the atypical identifying kids who are not in distress don't feel bullied either way, either to um, that they have the freedom they need to develop, and that the cisgender kids can, you know, accept and be friends, and we can bring this community together. I really think we have a chance to do that, but we are still feeling that parental rights are being violated, and that we are being told without opt-out options, and, and things are coming down the pipelines, and they're bypassing what the school board has set up to help manage this. And so we still have time to make changes and corrections, and I'm just hoping as a school board, um, you guys take a look at what is the real intent of having this book run in sixth grade, and even this solution that I have presented, is it really the best solution for our kids? And uh, I, hope, I hope the diversity community really can help us bring this community back together. Thank you. Thanks. Is there any other public comments? Hi, good evening. My name is Corey Below, and I live in town on Nichols Drive, right? over there. I have three children in the Saline area school system. My oldest son is a freshman at the high school, and I have twins in sixth grade. One is male, and the other identifies as genderless. Uh, not, they're, they're not transgender specifically, but they are neither male nor female, and they use the pronouns they then and theirs. I want to let you know that I admire you. I admire the school board. You stuck with your decision and you decided to read I and Jazz in the elementary schools. You received a lot of backlash. I attended the school board meeting that Tuesday following and after the reading, not as a speaker, but as a supporter. And during that meeting, I tried to think about how you must have been feeling. Uh, you have to have warring thoughts between what you believe, what others believe, and what you do with right. It made me think about the school board in New Orleans, that must have, what they must have gone through when Ruby Bridges became the first black child, the black girl to attend her all white school. They tried to prevent her from going to the school. They set up this really tough entrance exam and she passed it, so they had to let her in. That school board must have endured a lot. I can only imagine the things that they had to sit through and listen to parents say about their fears. Um, yet they stuck with their decision. And imagine what things would be like today if they hadn't. And what I'm here to do today is to ask you not to go backwards. Please keep moving forward. It can never be wrong to be nice, to be kind, to be bully free. Transgender kids exist. They're in your schools. They're in your neighborhoods. Chances are you don't even know who they are. They're going to be sitting right next to you and you don't know. And do you need to know? We have African American, Asian American, Latin American, Jew Jewish, Muslim, Christian, white kids, and all combinations of those children that I've mentioned, and many that I haven't mentioned, they all exist. We're not going away. Don't shut us out. Don't let others shut us out. Don't continue to breathe hate. Teach kindness. Teach acceptance. Teach what is right. 
Uh, my twin sixth grade teacher, English teacher, sent out an email on Friday letting parents know that their next unit was a delay free project. And that she would be reading a book called George, which is a story about a transgender girl. Her email made my day. I was so proud to have my children in this class. I told my coworkers about it. I told them about how the Swain administration and the teachers have been so very supportive of my family and my child, and I could have been a happier to be a part of this great school system. Then Sunday evening, she sent out a different email. And this one, this time, included Scott Graydon on the email. And this email said that she would not be reading the book, and that the kids would have a choice to read either a book called Ghost or a book called George. And I can only imagine, I don't know why that changed, why there was a change, what happened, um, but I can tell you that my heart sank. Um, and I tried to think about it from others' perspectives as well. If my child wasn't different, if this wasn't my everyday life, how would I feel about my kids learning about transgender children? Well, I hope that I would be open to it. I've taken my kids to the Army, Navy, wheelchair basketball games because I thought it was important for them to see that. I have taken my kids to different Martin Luther King Jr. activities at the University of Michigan. And when my oldest was in elementary school, he was on a Hanukkah book at the elementary school book fair. And I didn't tell him, no, you can't have a book that's not a religion. I bought the book for him. I want my kids to learn about differences, and I expect my children to respect others and be open to their differences. So I'm not getting that. My point is this, I'm asking you, please don't go backwards. Please keep moving forward. Teach kindness and continue with the anti-bully campaign. We can only get better if we talk about it. Ignoring it isn't an option, and people are different. Different is okay, and different is good. Thank you. changed over from the library. Uh, used to go here to middle school. Um, you know, when you leave school, you don't stop educational services. And I'm here to talk about a deficit in the Saline community. Educational services not present in the surrounding localities. And that deficiency is in the Saline District library system. Our library, like many smaller libraries in the southeastern Michigan area, is a member of the library network. And that's a cooperative of individual public libraries which create a more comprehensive system in aggregate. Unlike surrounding communities, Celine refuses to participate in reciprocal borrowing. A few years back, I had the good fortune to participate fully in the library network system in Brighton because I qualified for a library card through my employer. The borrowing turnaround was faster than the Melcat and there was a better overall collection of available materials. Additionally, I could drive to any of a number of local libraries and use their facilities and collections directly. For instance, I had been waiting 44 days for a DVD from Celine. But today, if I wish, I could drive to Chelsea, Dexter, Belleville, Northville, or South Lyon and borrow the same item immediately. But only if Celine participated in reciprocal borrowing. I'd like to share some rough budget numbers from other local libraries. Dexter's preliminary budget most recently is $1,545,961. Chelsea has got a budget of $2,012,846. Celine, for comparison, has $2,250,954. And Ix Lancy has $3,852,703. Why is Celine the outlier in sharing resources? This district is not significantly underfunded compared to others, nor is it spending unmatched amounts on its collections and services like Ann Arbor, with a budget of roughly $15,500,000. The resources of the Saline District Library would be improved by participating fully in the library network with reciprocal borrowing, and this, this community 
would then be in line with Belleville, Brighton, Canton, Chelsea, Dearborn, Dexter, Howell, Livonia, Manchester, Northville, Novi, Pinckney, Plymouth, South Lyon, Westland, and Ypsilanti. And there are more, but those are just the closest ones. I will be formally posing this question to the Library Board of Trustees and the Library Director, and I hope to receive a better response, a more comprehensive response, than the late Leslie Needhammer's, which was that people might destroy our stuff. If this is a legitimate monetary consideration that includes participation with the library network, taxpayers should be appraised of it so we can work to appropriate funds for better library services for our district. Thank you. So I know that it was well thought out and deliberate, thoughtful, caring. My concern at this point is how much of a say do teachers have in classroom day-to-day -day teaching? If a few parents can come in and dictate what a teacher is teaching, I don't feel like that's a public school. Um, I can't imagine how they would feel about their jobs if they're constantly being told what they can and can't teach. So at some point, my thought is that the administration needs to support their teachers instead of bowing to the wishes of a minority. If that's how we're going to educate our children, by a consensus of the parents, core curriculum isn't really relevant anymore. What our kids learn is going to be limited by their community. Um, instead of expanding their minds and sharing experiences and having that conversation about the material that's in that book in a safe space by a teacher and your peers. I appreciate what the teachers do. I can't teach my kids everything. Nor do I necessarily want to be the one to teach them if they don't necessarily have the background or the information. So I guess my statement to you is that um, support your teachers. Um, they're doing a great job for you. Back them up. Thank you. Does anybody want my copy? Are you read it? I'll take it there. And her search from the Foundation for Southern Area Schools. A bit delayed update about her snow blast. It was here a couple of weeks ago, but on February 2nd, we had a very successful snow bus at Travis. We raised again it's over $75,000, which was very exciting and uh, had a wonderful night. So it was very exciting. But on to the next thing and a uh, wonderful opportunity to showcase our grants. So our next event is coming up May 2nd, and I sure hope you can all be there at Imagine Theater. 
Uh, Mr. Glantz and imagine one of our top sponsors have been uh, kind enough to open up their place again for us to come and basically have a little bit of a fundraiser as well as showcasing uh, our grants uh, that we've given out this year. We will also have the Hall of Fame 2019 announcement. Uh, those inductees, we will um, also honor outgoing trustees that just recently left in the last year, and also a thank you to all of our volunteers. So again, May 2nd, invitations will go out in a matter of a few weeks, and starts at 5 o'clock, and it'll be wonderful, and we have a private showing of Avengers Endgame, that they're sitting out. So thank you all again for all your support and everything that you do for the foundation. We are <coughs> eternally grateful. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Administrator. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, my name is Eva, and um, I want to talk again. Um, or not again, but I'm going to talk about um, how important it is um, to support our transgender and gender non conforming um, kids in the school. Um, you know, uh, what um, Mrs. Washington and Mr. Shuko um, brought up tonight is the, the mirrors and the windows, and how important it is for our kids to see those mirrors and windows within the books that they read and, um, and how important it is to see those stories um, i recently asked to read um, a book um, one of two books um, in my child's classroom um, one of them was called um, phoenix goes to school and the other one is um, julian um, is a mermaid um, they're both books about kids that are uh what is transgender, the other is gender non-conform. Um, this is um, a story that's very close to me. Um, I have a family member that is transgender. Um, I have uh, three kids, um, one of them has already graduated, two, um, one in the middle school, one in the elementary school. <laughs> and they're asked and uh, questioned all the time about um, you know, the, their gender or, you know, who they used to be or who they didn't used to be. So the fact that I couldn't tell this story to my child's classroom really hurt me. Um, you know, it, it was clearly, um, you know, a form of discrimination and um, ignorance. And I, and I understand that the teacher was probably concerned about the backlash of hearing um, parents that may have been heard that their kid heard the book in the classroom. But what we all need to understand is that, you know, in that classroom, there is someone that's living with that here and now. And if these kids don't understand it, then they're never going to be able to accept it. We, we as children, when we were children, we read many books, um, like um, Charlotte's Web. Does that mean that we grew up and turned into spiders? Or, you know, we lived on a farm and raised kids? Um, Harry Potter is a very popular book. Does that mean that we're going to turn into a wizard and we're going to be able to cast spells? Just because you read a book doesn't mean that's what you turn into. It's just um, a window into someone else's life and what they're going through. Um, I really stress that you guys continue to um, practice best practices within the district. And you, you continue to move forward in um, your own policies for these best practices and guidelines. Um, it's so important to these children. What people that don't have a transgender child don't understand is that you have two choices. You can support that child in who they are, or you can have a dead child. And none of us want to have a dead child. 
but the reality is if you don't support that child, that is what very likely could happen. The American Academy of Pediatrics supports those same guidelines in parents supporting their children to be who they are. And that's all we really want as a parent is to love our children and feel sure they're happy and healthy. You know, no matter what your other beliefs are behind it. You know, the kids come first and their safety and their well-being. Thank you very much. Any other public comments? Um, just a couple of quick updates. Um, one is it is exam week, and so um, kind of a modified schedule as we um, kind of work through that. And we are beginning our third trimester, so the last kind of 12 weeks we're in the school. We have a couple more weeks before spring break, and as you uh, all well know, it's a sprint to the end of the year. So it's going to be an active time of, time of year, and we're excited uh, to kind of get into that last third. Tomorrow, we're hosting an event called the Future of Work. Um, with Luke Glazier and uh, Michigan Future kind of talking about issues impacting our society moving forward. It is kind of a forward look in terms of some of the skills, so looking forward to having a group coming and, and kind of debriefing and trying to get some feedback as to what's next for us in the school district as it relates to student skills uh, onto the future. That's all I have. Board members? Uh, this week we had the uh, Board of Education meeting and Michigan Future was there. Uh, Michigan Future is uh, school Board Association, which is all of the districts in Washtenaw County came together and we had a presentation by um, uh, a woman and there's information in the back and it was about reporting on the school finance research collaborative and so what that was was when they were looking at what does it really take to educate a child and looking at what that facts really are, and every district in, in the state does not fund like we should for <coughs> kids. And so there's some really interesting facts, I'm not going to go into it, but I would encourage you to pick that up um, and contact your legislators because now is the time when they're looking at budgets um, for schools, for everything else, and the, the um, Governor has budget proposals, but it'll be interesting to see what happens with the legislator. And so it's important for you to all be informed so you can contact your legislators too. I, I encourage you to look at the summaries at the back there. Uh, the trustees Valenti and I were, were also there, and it was fascinating. The magic number, the base numbers were $9,590, well, like and we fall a bit short in this state. And that's just, that doesn't include service or transportation and yeah. you know, so we're a long ways off. Um, on March 2nd, NASB ran a little thing up in Lansing dealing with the same sort of thing. Uh, budget and finance, actually it was Michigan Treasury who put it on and I was there, a few others. Uh, I don't think anyone from Celine was there, but I saw a few from uh, Washington up there. Uh, it's, all, it's all about the money. <laughs> Sadly, it's all about the money. Um, I have some stuff. Yeah. Um, I, I know Dennis is going to talk about the finance committee, but I joined a new committee um, this month and I was excited about the Coalition um, for Quality Community. So we met here at Liberty. Um, it's an organization of uh, leaders within the community. So um, uh, the Saline Library, for example, Chief Heart of the Police Office, uh, Anna from Community Education. Um, the downtown, the Main Street Association for Saline. So once a month we get together and take turns sharing and talking about our functional areas and then also sharing what's going on in each of our areas. Um, Chief Hart was our presenter and chair this week, uh, or last week, um, and I know he's going to share the presentation with, with Scott to, to kind of set up the entire <coughs> board, but fascinated um, with the training and everything that they're involved with. Um, learned that we had 7,000 calls for service uh, in the Saline community, in the city of Saline in the last year. Um, so a call for service is something that generates a police report, I learned. Uh, we, have, we had 1,500 911 calls in the city of Saline. And I also learned that uh, within two to three months, we'll be going to a text-based uh, 911 service for a, a more immediate response. So that, that was all very interesting. Talked a lot about traffic, talked a little bit about bus safety, which was good. Um, so I was happy to, to join that committee 
and try to help and hear from other community members. Um, been really busy also uh, continuing classroom visits and trying to really understand um, our, our staff and our students in rooms um, above the, the grades that my kids are in. So spent a lot of time at Celine Middle School. Thank you, um, Brad, uh, for having me over there. I went to Team Trio, so that's Joanna Markowitz, uh, Tina D'Andrea, and Emily Polka. Um, fascinating to see how three teachers work together and kind of divvy up that responsibility. And I was very pleased to see Emily teaching uh, junior achievement while I was there. Um, in seventh grade, I met with Kirsten Zemedes, uh, Amy Rothke, Stacey Nazareth, and Rachel Alyssa. Uh, I hope I pronounced all of those correctly. Um, and seventh grade was really interesting. Talked with a lot of students, both in sixth and seventh grade, um, about choosing seventh grade electives and about um, you know the change from heritage to the middle school. Talked with them about language. So one of the students that I talked to was really excited to be taking German for the first time next year. And learned how they kind of make that decision process and what's important <coughs> to them at the middle school. Um, and then it's March's reading month, as, as you all saw from uh, our heritage presentation. Um, so got to go to uh, Katie Wands today, Melissa Urban's, and uh, Lisa Latona's room and, and read to the kids, and they love it. Um, what I will say is every single um, teacher, uh, which I was in their classroom, invited all of us to visit anytime. Um, they really like visitors. The students really like visitors. Um, I was so impressed with the middle school with the sixth graders. It was so student-led. They were the ones that took me around. It wasn't the teachers. Um, so they want to make sure that we, we come and come often. Um, they're really proud of what they have going on. Um, we did add a field trip to the consent agenda and then there was uh, some kind of So can I have a recommended motion to approve the board agenda as the So moved. All those in favor, please signify with an aye. Aye. Those so opposed? Hearing on the motion carries 6 0. Scheduled report is the multi tiered system of support. Uh, Dr. Lock. Okay. Thank you. Well, I'd like to invite up with Caroline Stout. She heads up our multi-tiered system of support team, which is fairly extensive across the district. Before she begins, just to give you a little bit of background on the importance of uh, MTSS, and that is uh, really looking at meeting research for years and years and years. And I've said this many times at these types of meetings, uh, but the staff that really stands out is that uh, whatever a third grader ends up reading at by the time they're done with third grade, there's a 90% chance that that's where they'll be when they get into high school. And so using that information and really uh, devoting a lot of different resources, a lot of our resources do go to early level reading intervention, is something that we as a district need to continue to do because there is a lot of um, research that supports that that's the right thing to do. And we need to make sure that we stay strong in that area. With that said, Caroline is going to go ahead and talk to us about the uh, MTSS uh, system and where we're at in the district. Thank you, Thank you members of the board. Uh, as Steve said, my name is Caroline Stout, and I'm um, an assistant psychologist. I'm going to go to the week. I'm also the MTSS coordinator. I'm really excited to present uh, a little snapshot. Um, this is the reading edition, so we're kind of going to get into the state of the state of um, how things go. Let's see. Okay. I need to do mine because we can't hear you back here. I'm so sorry. Is it going now? I'll just. Okay. Maybe you guys can handle this December. If I stand here and I speak loud, is that okay? Yes. All right. Thank you. Um, so, the multi tier system of support, um, just to throw a couple acronyms on, um, um, encompasses both a sponsored mission or guide system for academics. And a PBIS or positive behavior intervention support system for behavioral support. If you haven't heard of that, that's our um, the model is represented by a pyramid. The idea here is that um, it is a tiered level, uh, tiered system of support offering different types of intervention, different levels of intervention based on student needs. Tier one is the foundation of the model, and that's our differentiated instruction for all students, um, whether that's the reader's workshop for reading or um, behavior expectations like the Pleasure Ridge High Five or the Movement 3 Ds or um, the Harvest Score. And that alone um, should meet the needs of at least 80% of our students, and it does. Um, we have data that shows that it does open the door, which is great. 
We also know, based on 30 plus years of research, that at any point in time, some of students need a little extra boost than that. Um, and this model allows for some intervention for students who need a little bit more support, and we call that tier two. Um, those are targeted research-based interventions in small groups, um, generally for about 10 to 15% of our students. And then tier three supports offer more intensive intervention, generally based, uh, generally smaller group, um, sometimes more uh, time or more frequent um, intervention, and generally targeting more basic needs. Um, these are some of the essential components of running this model. Um, but one thing I wanted to point out are the arrows on the side of the, the pyramid here. So again, we have multiple levels of support based on need, but we also want to make sure that we have downward shifting. So our goal. Um, is for all of this to result in students not needing the support. So we measure effectiveness by how well we return students to only needing tier one. Uh, without this, we're operating a Hotel California model of intervention. You can check on time. You can check in any time you like, but you can never leave. Um, I want to also point out that this obviously takes a lot of work. Um, I'm not going to read through all my slides, but I want to point out a couple of the people who are here today who've been doing some of this great work. Trisha Roy is the MTSS Manager of Woodland. Kristen Cohen has been a wonderful teacher uh, doing a heritage pilot with us. Barb Matthews and Erin Brunas are two of our amazing um, literacy tutors. Um, so it really takes a village. Um, some of the background on MTSS. It really originally it originated at the national level um, as a bridge kind of between special and general education to offer the continuum supports um, for students um, when they need it, rather than having to wait for the gaps to be so large that students qualified as having a disability, we're now able to target needs when they're small and gaps are a lot easier to close. Um, it is also now part of MT's Top 10 10 initiative and is mandated by uh, the third grade retention law. And in Selene, this all started about in 2010 uh, when we began to partner with some state and national organizations, including the National Center for Intensive Intervention, um, to launch K1 meeting supports. Since then, we've expanded uh, to K3 meeting supports, plus a pilot heritage group we'll talk about in a minute, um, and some work at, at Selene Middle School. We also have behavior supports in place, uh, in tiers one through three, um, math intervention in about a third of our lower elementaries, and we're really proud that we've been able to hone our practices to increase effectiveness while keeping costs low, including reducing um, special education eligibility in terms of the number of students eligible as, specifically, um, as having a specific learning. Um, sorry. Um, so the way that we see MTSS is really, um, I should say our hope, is to um, use the MTSS framework to give students the foundation that they need to reach for all the compass points. So the goal is to really braid all these initiatives together to lead to successful student outcomes and lifelong learners. So, <coughs> um, over the last almost 10 years, this framework has really changed um, and adapted and also taken on some of the culture of each building um, that we are doing this work in. But in all cases in Slane School, these are some of the common elements of the MTSS framework. We use universal screening, so we use multiple kinds of data to um, kind of take a temperature check on students three times a year to make sure again that we're catching students when gaps are small, they're easier to close, and that we're really responsive to that. Um, we have a collaborative problem-solving process that involves not only frequently looking at that data formally as, as a large group um, with all stakeholders uh, in the school around the table, general ed, special ed, um, literacy support, ELL, um, but also just continuous informal discussion to make sure that if supports are not uh, sufficient to close those gaps, we're changing what we're doing and we're looking at the problem differently, we're looking at the situation um, we use research-based interventions to target student needs in this model, and we also monitor the progress of those receiving intervention to make sure that we are closing those gaps as time as the essence. Um, this is a complicated uh, picture to give you an idea of how typical groupings work. So this is how it works for all but two grades at Harvest and uh, some of the work at the middle school currently. So if you've heard of um, the sit time or win time or team time, it all refers to this half hour of instruction um, that's in addition to tier one, so in addition to that core um, reading or math instruction, and that's supposed to really target students' um, specific needs uh, beyond what can be done in a classroom with 25 or 30 kids. 
So how we do it is we look at all students um, together, say in this case at a grade level, and then um, we have a discussion with all those team members as to what the student needs, and we make smaller groups for students who need support, say in tier three and tier two, we make larger groups uh, for students who need extension support, it's allowed us to maximize resources, offer some extension and reinforcement uh, for those who are at or maybe far above grade level, and also reduce the stigma for those who receive intervention because it's no longer a co-op model, it's all students. Um, so here are some things that are new uh, to K3. And we're really proud of the fact that now the MTSS model is kind of just part of the way we do things. So hopefully we won't even have an acronym anymore for it someday. Um, so we can just say this is kind of how we do business. Um, we have built up uh, some systems for providing intervention uh, for behavior for specific types of behaviors, particularly attention seeking. The next frontier is really trying to systematize the process for providing intervention uh, for students who are struggling with internalizing behaviors, anxiety, um, trauma, things, because we want to make sure that we are able to provide those supports in a timely manner when students need them and that they can be effective. Um, we've also had the K3 uh, teams help launch supports at Heritage, and um, those are some kind of specific things that are happening at each of the K3s. Um, so, um, since 2010, we've had some form of MTSS going in the district, but since 2014, we've been unable to track that data in a data warehouse so that we can come up with figures like this and like this. So currently, our fourth graders uh, who are in kindergarten in 2014, um, we are able to kind of see what they had in terms of intervention since they have been with us. Some of them needed only a six week uh, little boost and some had reading intervention for a couple years. 44% um, of the 350 current fourth graders had some form of reading intervention. And this is, I heard of how they looked when they exited third grade. So you can see the kind of brown, light brownish color are the students who left third grade no longer needing support. The yellow part are the students who left third grade needing some tier two intervention. The light mauve color are the students who left their grade needing tier three support, and the dark wine colored uh, one are the students who left their grade um, on an IP for uh, reading specifically. Does that make sense? Um, a little bit of data for a heritage pilot before I pass it over to Laura and Alice. Um, so another thing that we're pretty proud about is that this year we've been able to launch a pilot with a uh, number of teachers in fourth and fifth grade at Heritage. And it's hard to summarize all of that in one slide, so we picked some oral reading fluency scores, and um, all the green are basically students who just since this fall have been able to either completely close the gap um, or are quite on their way, and we expect will close the gap very shortly. Those in the orange part of the pie chart are ones whose progress were either, either inadequate or inconsistent, um, and so we're still working to make sure that those, uh, we can change what we're doing to um, have those trade off. Yeah. All right. So, uh, at Heritage, because really this pilot was, was new, this MTSS pilot, uh, we needed to problem solve a lot of things. Play the <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's because I can't see. Computer. I'll do it. Yeah, you're too far away. So, we gotta be so, over here. Yeah. So just keep pushing. Yeah. Yeah. So even the people looking for. So my MTSS, my MTSS, the schedule, parent communication, who will run groups, how do we screen students, right? The problem solving process around that. Um, you know, dividing off tier one needs. We had a lot that we had to problem solve of uh, the calendar. So Lots of thinking, lots of teamwork around getting this pilot going this year for us. And let's just keep going on. <laughs> <laughs> it also involved a lot more than talking about that. And before I do, I just wanted to bring up a point. So, to Steve's point, K3 is where the emphasis of MTSS is, it? absolutely. However, we still have kids who come to us in fourth grade with those needs, and we've identified kids in every classroom that, that have these needs. Unfortunately for this year, 
we were only to be we we're only able to choose a pilot group or have a pilot group in both fourth and fifth grade in order to see how this could play out in our future. So what did this involve? It involved a year of planning, Dr. Lockship, creating a micro credentialing course, data analysis, a lot of creativity in scheduling and everything else, making and tweaking schedules. Consensus building, how are we gonna do this? What are we going to do together? What's going to be different than what other teams do? We did a lot of intervention research the year before, with it, which interventions are going to work um, for, for which um, inconsistency in, the student re in student reading, what groupings are we going to have with kids, coordinating district-wide because we had so much support from the K-3 buildings, thank you very much. We had to coordinate schedules with our K-3 buildings. Branding team time, what were we going to call it? That was a big deal. And everyone landed on team time and the kids are so proud of being able to go and be with other team members. I think that's really worked into a plan where they feel the ownership of this time, which has been very, very successful. And lots of other things. I just keep clicking because this will go on. Because there's a lot of work involved with this as well this year. Documenting, collaboration, learning. Okay. So here's some more specifics about the pilot this year. Um, I kind of mentioned uh, earlier. So we had three fourth grade teachers that are part of this pilot. Uh, this is Pete, Ms. Katie, and Ms. Webster. And then we have four fifth grade teachers, right? Mrs. Mendez, Mrs. Holland, as well as uh, Mrs. Adams and Mr. Spicer. And with uh, those teams, we have three kind of team time periods throughout the day. Uh, during team time, all students will move and be part of that team time for that 30 minute block for either kind of an extension or an intervention, if you will. <coughs> students in the tier two and tier three, okay? Um, our progress monitor, and there's a grouping that we're doing as well, right? So as we're seeing the students are making progress, we're responding to the intervention, we're doing regrouping, and that's happening every six to 10 weeks. From a staff perspective, right, it's kind of all hands on deck, really, because if you, if you look, we have uh, kind of classrooms that are on education teachers that are part of this, like education teachers, paraeducators, you have the literacy tutors, um, you have Laura, myself, and Steve, um, and then you have Caroline, um, we have a lot of people who have been a part of and played a role in this pilot this year. All of that has made it a success so far. So we wanted to show you some teacher thoughts, some parent thoughts, and some student thoughts, both positive and not so positive. So a lot of, or, or some teachers said that they were glad to see students receiving tier two and tier three research-based interventions. They've seen positive growth in students, and particularly, um, and it, the data is very preliminary, but in this last NWEA round, uh, it looked really, really promising. Raising confidence in students, the ability to deep dive into areas of need, um, with increased collaboration, because a lot of times teachers would think, I have to do this by myself, students are in their classrooms, and yeah, now they have a team that they can bounce ideas off of, which is great. Students are, like I said before, students are really excited about going to team time. They like seeing different classmates in other classrooms, so it's been really great. There have been some limitations to this, um, and our tutors will definitely empathize with this in the physical space of heritage. Um, some teachers have guilt over students who need support in non-pilot classes. I kind of took that as a positive as well because they're seeing such positive growth in their own students that they wish students from other classes were able to do this. And so I see that both as a positive and a negative. Time to plan for tier one extension activities has been a negative because what do you do with tier one and what we've also deemed as a tier one plus group, so for our really high flyers, to be able to get extension activities is really important as well. And then comprehension interventions are just difficult to find. At the K-3 level, you find a lot of oral fluency, decoding, but as you get older, the difficulties get more complicated and comprehension interventions are hard to find. Uh, we solicited some parent thoughts and some parents said in terms of growth, it is just better. No tears anymore, how great is that? So their child would come home and there's no turmoil over reading. 
Um, I have to tell him twice to put down the book, which is great. He is reading and he is choosing to read for pleasure and it has just been awesome. Our parent thoughts on that. And then finally, the student thoughts. I've improved my fluency a lot because I needed a lot of practice and now I've accomplished it. I think team time is one of the best. I feel like team time has really helped me improve because I can do my, le my level instead of being stuck with something I already know or that something that is too challenging or too difficult. And then lastly, team time has helped me improve on writing and reading a lot. I feel like it is just my level. So those are some positive and student thoughts. Before we turn it over to questions though, I do have to publicly um, praise Caroline Stout for all of the work that she has done at Heritage with us and our tutors who have been so, yeah, absolutely well. So you have a question, but I do want to comment. This is something that we've been at for a long time and kind of falls into the, the kind of the chopping wood mentality where you really have to get at this work and do it over time. Um, you know, much of it is kind of quiet now in terms of there was a lot of kind of, I think maybe, I will call more energy more public acknowledgement of it several years ago, but we continued at this and it's really making a difference in terms of our, our long-term progress. We talk a lot about the compass here. We don't necessarily always talk about our fundamental uh, and foundational approach in order to make sure that we can access um, you know, those attributes that we talk so much about. So this is kind of some of the behind the scenes stuff you can always get to see. Last year, uh, a number of us went up to see Dr. Nell Du talk uh, about reading interventions in the state of Michigan and watching out for the drops and so forth and how horrid our scores were. And she listed out all sorts of things that we could do and should do. And I just thought, wow, that's a lot of work. And here we are seeing it, and you know what? It's a lot of work. Yes. And I appreciated that, that very busy slide. I was having a little trouble with it. But, uh, it is a lot of work, and I, I, you're, you're to be commended. The whole, the whole district is, I think, is for everyone who's been involved in the interventions. So thank you. And, and I wanted to say, you know, you're, you're doing the right stuff by the kids knowing that they're not they're not the odd ones out there. Other people who are going through the same stuff, and I think that kind of makes them feel like, oh, it's okay, and now I know what I need to do. But I've got an army with me doing the same thing, and you know, I think that's important for them to know they're not alone. Yeah, thank you. And I commend our teaching staff for that. They were so thoughtful in the process of all of this how the kids were going to feel. So whether it was going to be a pullout model, whether it was everyone moving, that was first and foremost on all of their minds were what, what was the social emotional impact of this before we were gonna to get to anything else. So they should be commended for that. Um, I, I have a question and this might be more for Emily or um, so this actually came up in sixth grade when I was visiting last week, and they were really excited. Uh, they were buzzing about this this pilot at Heritage, and they wanted to know what about sixth grade. So I guess Caroline, that might be for you, Emily. Emily, would you like to answer? Yeah, I mean, there's it's a numbers game, it's a capacity game. So we tried all the years that I've been at middle school, we tried to figure out. The people that we have can we maximize every single second that we have that. So we have Aaron um, who comes in and is working with some sixth grade. It's all based on times and schedules, and so that's what we're doing that. That piece, we haven't been able to take it to scale because we don't have the people to do that. But we did say, you know what, we can't take it to scale, but what do we have? What are the classes that does work? And let's put in intervention and help at least six classes, we can't go 15, but if we have this time, so she's running around helping out the class that I think it's sure that's come out to be just this. There's no lack of it. And um, you know, the good news is if we work this we need to support them, but as well sure there's still something, and that's hard. Yes. Um, I get to see time and I really like it. It's really fun. Thank you. Thank you. Did you listen? I'm so listening. I'm so listening. Can I ask what grade you're in? I'm fourth. Fourth grade. Excellent. Who's your teacher? Webster. Webster. Thank you. 
Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. discretionary funding in the amount of $7,499.60 as submitted by Community Education Director Paul. Brian? Brian? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, first, before I talk about care, I just want to talk about the school groups and just a special thank you for mentioning uh, Student from SFA. We have two grad shows a year. If you're from Sydney, you probably know about that. Uh, we have 22 school groups that worked at the last two shows. And without those groups, we could not pull those shows off. And especially at SFA, I did my first show in 2004. It was a November show. I saw the parking going on. I saw these kids out there. And we went to the November trash show. It was crazy. And I just remember asking, I think it's Scott, like, who's working at He was at SFA. And I was like, our universe is not here again. 2019, every year they do the show and they do a great job. So I just want to say, oh, you guys will do the job they do. Um, going on to CARES, you have the information in front of you. As you can see, this is our round one. You had four grants submitted for $11,151.56. The CARES Advisory Board approved um, three grants, totaling $7,000, $7,499.60. Uh, I'll go over the grants that were. Approved. Which I'll start with the one that was not approved. That was the stem part in the fifth corner. Uh, we requested some more information, and we weren't able actually to get it in a timely manner. We're releasing that probably around two or next year. Uh, first, we'll talk about is Celine Middle School across. We received one thousand seven hundred twelve. Um, the board approved one thousand seven hundred fifty-seven dollars and sixty cents for new uniforms and goals. It's a program that is going through the community ed department. Um, it's for the girls program. Uh, the second one was for the Dixie Marionettes. Um, $3,000 was approved, and that grant was basically to print books to explain the history of the Marionettes in the future and um, looking at exhibits, which I believe is going to be one right back here. So, a lot of hot shapes and we're able here as well. So, that's what that grant was for. And the third one is for a sculpture at Henning Field, uh, Buzzy Smile, for $2,742. So those were the three grants that the peers advised you to work um, recommend for the school board. Any questions about the grants? Um, wasn't Leslie's smile supported by the uh, Arts and Culture Committee for Celine? And is there any way that you can keep track of other funding sources for the same project? Uh, well, I can see for what they applied for. They applied for the project goal, I think, was over, I don't know what it was at. 25,000. 25,000. Oh, so this is just a partial. This is a partial. The global project was 25,000. I believe I saw the Bixby uh, Mary Nansen uh, Arts and Culture as well. No, and that was also a, that was also a partial as well. We should stop serving on so many committees. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thanks. And thank you, Tim, as well. So, you know, guys have to report. I appreciate it. Thanks. All in favor? Aye. Thanks for responding back. Aye. 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 Those opposed? Carrying down the motion carries 6 0. Never recommended motion to approve the purchase of two polygon storm shelters for the new West Parking Lot Island at the high school in the amount of $66,147.20 as submitted by Facilities Director Clary. So moved. Um, I'll touch on, on this one. Um, First here, the, the polygon uh, structures are ones. It's part of the bond project. It's something where, uh, from a financial standpoint, it makes sense that we actually are the purchasers of the product that they actually handle the installation. Clark will be helping coordinate these. These are structures that are uh, kind of mimic a shed roof and will be placed between the um, outside the existing west entrance to the school as part of the, the parking lot redesign. Again, it's our intention to be able to have a location for students and other people who are waiting either to be into the building or in the parking lot area to be kind of away from the entry point to the building uh, in a safer environment, covered, um, as well as having power out there if they want to do some things, the outside classroom space uh, as well. So uh, this company is one that we work with on the uh, structure that's between Heritage and Woodland. Again, the, the, the style will be very different, but uh, the company we found to be a quality. I found it 
it interesting that it costs more to install them than it does to actually purchase them. But, um, <laughs> These are solar powered charger stations. Uh, we'll have power from the yeah. All those in favor, please signify to aye. Uh, aye. Those opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries 6 0. Then a motion to approve the purchase of 13 new pieces of training each pack equipment for the middle school science pod renovation in the amount of $91,992 is submitted by facilities director Claire. Summer. Summer. So yeah, the cooperative will allow us to buy equipment that we want to purchase. It's not the low cost bidder. Um, it gives us a competitive price um, for quality work. Will this tie into the other systems in the building too? Yes, yes. We've already done handful of train systems and controls in the building. We'll get any controls in these as well. Uh, we're placing the center, the center pod and starting with their work out. All of them. Did you have a question? No, I was just going to say I noticed that we're still under buddy on the. <laughs> Barely everybody. Yeah, right? we have a meeting so next week, uh, next Tuesday. We'll see where we're at. Yeah. Uh, we're at it's, it is extremely tight. These, these their costs are consistent with what we had anticipated, but I will tell you, we are very, very tight. So, uh, okay. all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries 6 0. Thank you, Rex. Thank you. Discussion item the Finance Committee update. Trustee Valenti. Yes, Finance Committee met. Monday, March 4th, and I'd like to thank Assistant Superintendent Lodge and Director Clary for indulging us on uh, doing a deep dive into certain general ledger line items. Uh, we went into the construction improvement through the Assistant Superintendent Lodge. We went into the buildings, grounds, and transportation with Director Clary. And coming out of that, I uh, very great confidence in, in their knowledge of the budget and what they're handling there. And uh, I was also somewhat surprised as to how little discretion and how tight these budgets are, uh, particularly in our buildings, grounds, and transportation, how tight that is. Uh, but I appreciate both of them. Thank you. Anything else? Next meeting, no joke, April 1st, <laughs> to talk about forecasting. <laughs> Policy committee update, Secretary Bay. Right, we met a week or so ago. I don't remember the precise date, um, but we have brought our new trustee, Susan <coughs> step up to speed on how we review policies. We looked at the NEOLA updating system, and uh, we also had a quick review of the uh, service animal policy, which was a lot more interesting than it might sound. And our next meeting will be sometime in the near future. Uh, yeah, just as, uh, as Trustee Austin um, indicated that the, um, the budget is extremely tight. I included some information in your packet and, and we're really with kind of about $6.5 million of construction, we're within 10% you know, or so. Um, we're still continuing to kind of vet out several aspects of the project. Where we are um, working through the um, kind of the review process related to the bids for the, the final bids for the West Lot. We intend to bring those to the board uh, next Tuesday at a special meeting, the 19th, it'll be at 6 o'clock here uh, for review. Uh, in addition to that, we'll also have a furniture um, uh, allocation as it relates to the middle school uh, science lab. We will work to go ahead and uh, just get the final purchase student on those. Um, and in doing so with the West Lot, there are some aspects relative to uh, stormwater retention that we're working through. And so um, we're going to move forward with awarding the bids. And then that's one of my concerns is to try to work with the county right now to determine how do we handle some of the uh, potential with stormwater uh, on that site and on that west lot. So getting very tight, uh, you know, we're 89 uh, days or so away from breaking ground and so we need to keep the wood and contractors um, finalized to put to work. So if we, if we haven't worked through the stormwater stuff, how is it fitting? It, it would be essentially, would be, yeah, it would effectively, um, it would be a change order uh, as it relates. Now we're confident that we're within a window. I think some of the discussion will be largely political in terms of uh, authority and some different things, but we're trying to, to be as um, appropriate and proactive as we can right now in order to get where we need to go uh, and not have to um, expand what seems to me to be already sufficient. Uh, 
retention systems. The consent agenda. Can I have a motion to authorize the following items as part of the consent agenda? A. Approval of the regular Board of Education meeting minutes of February 26, 2019. B. Approval of the Board Finance Committee meeting minutes of February 4, 2019. C. Approval of the Board Finance Committee meeting minutes of March 4, 2019. D. Approval of the Board Policy Committee meeting minutes of February 19, 2019. E. Approval of payment of the general fund accounts payable on March 12, 2019 in the amount of $306,297.17. F, approval of payment of bond series one fund accounts payable on March 12, 2019 in the amount of $2,042.50. G, receiving filed a March curriculum finance and human resources reports. H, approval of the following field trips as submitted by Superintendent Graydon. Field trip number 122, softball trip to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, March 24th to 30th, 2019. Field trip number 124, the AP trip to Stratford, Ontario on May 21st, 2019. Field trip number 125, Skills USA State Conference in Grand Rapids, Michigan on April 5th to 7th, 2019. Field trip number 128, the Michigan Speech Annual Tournament to Mackinac Island on May 17th to 19th, 2019. And I approval of the early graduation request as submitted by Superintendent Graydon. So moved. All those in favor, please signify with aye. 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 Those opposed, hearing none, the motion carries 6 0. Um, the next agenda. Um, it's a little bit confusing. Our next, uh, we have a special meeting, but our next regular meeting agenda, we will have some information related to the National Clearinghouse. Naomi Norman will be coming to talk a little bit about kind of student data as it relates to graduates. So uh, we've done a deep dive in that area in the last couple of years. We, uh, we met with us, the last time I met with uh, Naomi, talked about making some tweaks to that, trying to look at uh, maybe a little more of a profile scenarios. So we can kind of change that up a little bit. But again, that's good data in terms of where our students go to college. Um, also, as it relates, not necessarily to the agenda, I did fail to uh, the administrative comments to note um, the diversity committee meeting was something that came up during public comment. We will uh, be having our first meeting on the 18th, uh, this coming Monday. Um, and again, there's a lot of discussion about kind of process and procedure. So I'm excited. Some of the issues that were discussed tonight will be on that agenda for us to really start to dive into. I think it's important that we do have a process and continue to move forward and make progress as an organization and as a community. And probably have a This is the second opportunity for public comment. Would anyone like to make public comment? So our next meeting of the Board of Education will actually be next week, March 19th, for a review of bids for the bond. Uh, it's a special meeting. Our other normal meeting will be April 9th. Uh, we'll carry on for our regular um, schedule. Uh, we do have a closed session tonight uh, for the purpose of uh, superintendent's quarterly evaluation. Uh, there will be no action taken at the end of that closed session. So can I have a recommended motion to enter closed session of the Board of Education at 8.15 p.m. with the intention to open session at 8.45 p.m. for the purpose of superintendent evaluation. This is a roll call vote. Trustee Austin. Aye.